بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so we had finished the issue of uh, Dajjal and now we move on to the next of the major signs and that is the issue of Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the issue of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is actually for our modern times I would say one of the most, if not the most problematic of the signs of Judgment Day. And it has caused many of our youth to question, to doubt. I myself have met people that have actually left Islam because of these types of tales. And we have to be honest and frank and not pretend as if this doesn't exist. Perhaps some of you are not accustomed to hearing people speak like this, but my philosophy is different. We are dealing with a crisis of people leaving our faith, our own children, our own young men and women. And of the reasons why is that we are not answering some of these issues that they bring and we dismiss them. And I myself have discussed many of these issues with these types of people. And one of them, not the only one, but one of them is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So we have to be very clear and frank and think critically even as we look at our tradition. So let us begin from the beginning. Who are Ya'juj and Ma'juj? And do we, what does the Quran and Sunnah say about them? The issue of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is something that doesn't just occur in the Hadith. It is explicit in the Quran. So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj in the Quran. Therefore, it is pretty clear that this is not something that you can say, oh, it's only found in one hadith. No, it is found in many a hadith. But even more importantly, it is found in the Quran itself. Where in the Quran? In two specific verses, only two. Only twice in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The first of them is Surah Al-Kahf. And at the very end of Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the issue of Dhul Qarnayn, Jazakallah khair. The story of Dhul Qarnayn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ Now, this is an entire lecture and an entire tafsir altogether. I do not have time to go into Dhul Qarnayn and the tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf, even though it's very juicy, maybe another time. What we do know, Dhul Qarnayn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we gave him power in this world and we allowed him a path everywhere. And he went to the easternmost, he went to the westernmost. There are stories mentioned in the Quran about Dhul Qarnayn. He was a just king. He thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He found people of all different types and persuasions. And then the final one that is mentioned, the final group of people, حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ بَيْنَ السَّدَّيْنِ When he came to essentially a valley, there's two mountain slopes coming here. وَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمَا قَوْمَا He found a group of people. لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ قَوْلًا They did not understand ذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ ذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ did not understand them. In other words, this was a civilization that had no middle ground. In the good old days, once upon a time, before Google Translate, how did people translate from one another? There were people, intermediaries, who had traveled to both lands. Inevitably, you would find somebody who spoke Latin and Arabic, who spoke, you know, this language and that language. You would find somebody. Dhul Qarnayn went to such a faraway land that the language of those people and the language of Dhul Qarnayn had no middle ground. So Allah is mentioning this is a far-flung civilization from where Dhul Qarnayn came from. So how then did they communicate when there is no language? They communicated with signs. You know when you're in a tourist in a different land, in a strange land, and you have no language whatsoever, you are forced to communicate with your hands. And mashallah, you can communicate so much with your hands, right? When you really have to, you can figure things out. So they are communicating with their symbols, with their gestures. And so they say that uh, This is the first mention of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. They say this group of people, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they are wreaking havoc in this world. So Dhul Qarnayn, you are a mighty king. 
you are a powerful person, we will give you something. We will give you money, whatever is the symbol for money, and you build a wall. You protect us from those people. O Dhul Qarnayn, you are clearly a man of intellect and power, a mighty king. You have a civilization we do not have. You have strength we do not have. So we want you to do something to protect us. So Dhul Qarnayn has gone to the furthermost regions of the world and there is a group of people even beyond that region. This is called Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And this civilization is saying, we want protection, we'll pay you to build this barrier between us and them. So Dhul Qarnayn says, I don't need your money. I don't need your money. I have plenty. What are you going to give me? Rather, I understand these people are evil. So Dhul Qarnayn sympathized with this other nation against Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So Dhul Qarnayn said, okay, you know, these people are really bad, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, I'll help you. What do I need from you? فَأَعِينُونِي بِقُوَّةٍ أَجْعَلْ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَهُمْ رَدَمًا I need your strength. I need manual power. I know what to do. I have the brains for it, but I need the bronze. I need the people. So Allah Azza wa Jal then mentions, that they took big bellows of furnace and iron and copper and they made a special type of barrier and they put these people, uh, they, 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 they used these bellows of the furnaces on a massive scale and they made an iron barrier that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, فَمَسْطَاعُوا أَنْ يَظْهَرُوهُ وَمَسْطَاعُوا لَهُ نَقْبًا Neither could they climb over the wall nor could they come underneath it nor could they bore a hole between it. So it is an effective uh, barrier. قَالَ هَذَا رَحْمَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّ Dhul Qarnayn, when he saw what he had done, he said, this is from Allah. Allah has blessed me. Allah has given me this. It's not from me. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, either Dhul Qarnayn or Allah is speaking. We don't know which one. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي Most likely it is Dhul Qarnayn or an angel or somebody is saying this. But this wall is temporary. When the command of Allah comes, then this wall will be of no use. It will be gone. وَتَرَكْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُوا فِي بَعْضٍ And on that day, these groups will be like, like waves, just intermixing amongst one another, and the trumpet will be blown. So this is the first mention of Dhul Qarnayn, and it deals with the wall, uh, uh, sorry, the first mention of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and it deals with the wall that was built by Dhul Qarnayn. Uh, the next mention of uh, Ya'juj and Ma'juj is Surat Al-Anbiya, verses 92 to 97. Surat Al-Anbiya, verses 92 to 97, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran regarding Judgment Day, إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ Until finally, Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be allowed out. Futihat. They will be allowed out. And they are going to be pouring down from every single you know, slope, from every mountain they're going to be coming. وَقُتَرَبَ الْوَعْدُ الْحَقِّ And judgment will now be asunder, will now be well close. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj are right before judgment day. This is pretty clear in the Quran. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي In Surah Al-Kahf. Over here, وَقَتَرَبَ الْوَعْدُ الْحَقُّ And the inevitable hour is coming. So twice in the Quran, Allah mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj, both of them, linking it directly to Judgment Day, right before Judgment Day. Now, by the way, uh, who is Dhul Qarnayn? Dhul Qarnayn is an enigmatic figure, and uh, most of our, some of our medieval commentators, and then especially uh, the most famous translator of the Quran of the previous uh, century, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, uh, whose impact in the translation was well known. All of us who grew up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we know Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translation as being the one that had the most impact, even though, long story, but uh, it wasn't very accurate. Number one, number two, can you believe this is a completely tangent? Abdullah Yusuf Ali couldn't speak Arabic properly. There's another point, he plagiarized it, but that's a whole different story, not related to our uh, topic here. Nonetheless, yani his translation went viral, and in his translation, in his commentary, he mentions that Dhul Qarnayn is, who does he mention? Alexander, all of you know this, okay? He mentioned Dhul Qarnayn is Alexander the Great. And it kind of spread amongst the masses. And this is what happens, subhanAllah, how thoughts spread, even if they're incorrect. And so many people thought Dhul Qarnayn is Alexander, but this is really 
almost 100% wrong for many reasons. Most obviously is that we know a lot about Alexander the Great. We know a lot about him. And he was not a believer in Allah, he was a pagan. He worshiped the idols. And Allah praises Dhul Qarnayn as being a worshiper. And Allah praises Dhul Qarnayn as being a righteous person. And Allah never praises paganism. And Allah never praises someone in this manner. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions Dhul Qarnayn says, Qala hadha rahmatun min rabbi. So Alexander, really almost impossible. Uh, some modern commentators have said that it is the uh, the Persian King Cyrus, uh, King Cyrus, who ruled from around 600 to 530 BC. So we're talking about 2,600 years ago, the Persian King Cyrus. And Cyrus, they say he's a candidate because he ruled over perhaps the largest empire the world has ever seen, or maybe the second or third largest. You know, there have been this massive empires. Alexander the Great probably did rule over the most largest empire, but temporarily. The Muslims, by the way, ruled over the largest for the longest period of time. But that's a different thing. Alexander, for a period of time, had more, but it fizzled out with his death. The benefit or the beauty of Islam is that wherever the Muslims went, Islam remained. And Islam and the Muslim civilization was the largest, but it wasn't unified uh, as solid, if you like, as it was under Alexander. So they say Cyrus. But firstly, there are a number of things that don't match up. And secondly, once again, Cyrus was a clear-cut pagan. There is a third theory that I personally am very sympathetic to. But these are just theories in the end of the day. If you don't like it or you like it, it doesn't matter. It's just my opinion or the opinion of some modern scholars. If Dhul Qarnayn were a historic figure, what do I mean by historic? I mean somebody whom we know. Because it is always possible that Dhul Qarnayn is pre-history pre-recorded history because recorded history begins around 4,000 years ago before that we don't really have records before that it's just unknown it's a big black box perhaps the Qarnayn is of that time frame Allah knows as for recorded history it goes back around 4,000 roughly 4,000 years or a bit more than that and we know pretty much all of the massive empires and the great kings of that time frame. If Dhul Qarnayn was one of the kings of this era, then we should know about him in terms of recorded history. Humanity would have known of these types of great kings who have conquered large swaths of the earth. So another candidate that I am personally very sympathetic to is the Persian Emperor Darius. The Persian Emperor Darius, who ruled 550 to 486 uh, BC. And Darius ruled over most of the known world at that time, most of what we now call Asia Minor, the Caucasus, the Balkans, Central Asia, even Egypt, North Africa. He had a massive empire and he himself traveled to the furthest east and the furthest west. And he led expeditions in, in his entire kingdom. And he fought against the Egyptians, he fought against the Chinese, he fought against or the, the people of that region, call them what you will, but he fought against all of these people. And what is interesting about Darius, unlike like Cyrus and definitely unlike Alexander, Darius was a monotheist. In contrast to the people before him and after him, we know from the books of history that Darius was an ardent monotheist. He was a strict believer in one God. He was beloved to his people. He had the reputation of being uh, a just king. And we have records of Darius. We have inscriptions to this day of Darius in which he is saying, I am the king, you know, uh, Darius and whatnot, uh, whom God has given power, whom God has bestowed power to. In other words, هذا رحمة من ربي, literally. God has blessed me with this power. It is very rare to find an ancient king who basically, I mean, Fir'aun said, Ana rabbukum al right? It is very rare to find an ancient king who is saying, look, I am a king, but the one above is the one who made me the king. He is the one who gave this to me. So, and, and by the way, there's also a, a very enigmatic inscription of Darius in which he is depicted as having two horns as well. So that kind of, yani, adds a little bit of, of, of spice, you know, uh, to the uh, whole mix there that Darius seems to be a likely candidate and he was an ardent believer. Now, some can say, for those of you who know your history, but Darius was a Zoroastrian. And we say, well, there was no Islam per se at this point in time. We're talking 2,000 years ago. And uh, uh, Darius believed in the one supreme God that they called Ahura Mazda. And that was their name for them, but it was one God that they believed in. So Allah knows best we are not 100% sure in any case and it is also possible that 
Thul Qarnayn could be somebody in recorded history whom we don't know. But that seems a bit difficult to swallow for someone like me. But so those of you who wish to, they can do that. But uh, you, you have two main options in my opinion. Either it's one of these historic figures or it's pre-recorded history. But then the issue comes again to, to make the, the issue more enigmatic. Generally speaking, Quranic history is recorded history. Yani only Nuh and some are pre pre history otherwise Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq the rest of them they're basically in the time frame that most uh, civilization is known so Allah Ta'ala knows best in any case Dhul Qarnayn is called Dhul Qarnayn according to our tradition either because he had two streaks of white hair or because he wore a helmet with two horns and Darius is depicted as two horns, or because he went to the east and the west, so the Qarn here is east and west, so the owner of the east and the uh, west. So this is the notion of Dhul Qarnayn. Now, we're gonna get to Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Before I talk about my own understandings and whatnot, let's see what else is mentioned. So this is Ya'juj and Ma'juj in the Quran. We don't have much about them other than they seem to be a race of savages. They seem to be a race that is barbaric. Killing, looting, plundering. And Dhul Qarnayn, who has never met them, is sympathetic that these people are bad. He just wants to build a wall to protect these strangers from Dhul Qarnayn. So, what does the Ahadith say? The Ahadith are numerous. In fact, in the six books of Hadith, there are around a dozen narrations of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So it's not a small amount. There are around a dozen, around. Bukhari and Muslim have around six or seven. So it is mentioned in the most authentic books, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The concept of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is found in our tradition. And of these Ahadith, is the hadith in Sahih Muslim where our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said 10 are the major signs of Judgment Day and he mentions Ad-Dukhan, Ad-Dajjal, ad the rising of the sun in the west, the descent of Isa ibn Maryam and Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So number 6 on this list mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. So he mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj as being one of the 10 major signs. In another hadith, Sahih Bukhari, this is the Bukhari hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually the Mutafaq Ali Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet said that uh, he quoted the verse in the Quran that Ya ayyuhannasu taqu rabbakum inna zalzalata sa'ati shay'un azim yawma tarawnaha tadhalu kullu murdi'atin amma arda'at wa tada'u kullu dhati hamlin hamlaha wa tara al-nasa sukara wa ma hum bisukara wa lakinna adab Allahi shadeed This is the beginning of Surah Hajj and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in it that this is judgment day that all mankind Fear your Lord. For indeed, the earthquake of Judgment Day is something to be terrified. On that day, you will see people, the woman will, the, the, the mother will neglect her breastfeeding child. And people will walk around as if they are drunk. But they are not drunk. But the punishment of Allah is severe. And the Prophet quoted this ayah and then he said that. When will this happen? When will people be so terrified? When Allah will announce to the angels or to Adam that, O oh Adam, take the people of Jahannam to Jahannam. And so from every thousand, 999 will go to Jahannam. The Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, with those odds, how can we be safe? If every thousand, nine hundred and ninety-nine are going to go to Jahannam, how can we be safe? What is the statistical chance of us winning? And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, I give you good news. For every one of you, there will be a thousand of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So this hadith, which is in Bukhari, is saying the quantity of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is astronomical beyond what we can even comprehend. Hadith in Sahih in uh, Musnad Imam Ahmad that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that you complain that there is no enemy. Some of the younger Sahaba are wanting to have a fight. You're complaining, we're not fighting. But you shall continue fighting. There will always be qital once the fitna begins that happened with the time of Uthman radiallahu anh. There will always be fighting until Ya'juj and Ma'juj come. 
So hadith is explicit that fighting will continue until Ya'juj and Ma'juj and then the Prophet ﷺ described them. They shall have faces that are flat, they shall have eyes that are narrow, they shall have hair that is yellowish and they shall descend from every single plane. Now, important to note, you shall fight until Ya'juj and Ma'juj. He didn't say you will fight Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We will learn you, we will not fight Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Ya'juj and Ma'juj are not fightable. Is that a correct verb? Is that a correct noun? Masdar. They are not capable to be fought. Let us be more precise and pedantic. You cannot fight Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We will not be fighting Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Fighting will continue until Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Which also means what? After Ya'juj and Ma'juj, no fighting. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj is the final frontier after which there will be no fitan. There will be no fitan after Ya'juj and Ma'juj. This also shows that Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be of the very, very, very last fitan to take place. Because after Ya'juj and Ma'juj, there will be no more major fitan for the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ said as well, another hadith. So right now, what am I doing? I'm narrating to you Quran and Sunnah. I'm narrating to you our sources. Then we will pause and go back and see what we can derive from those sources. Okay, because we need to really think deeply. And in all likelihood, we will have to do a part two for Ya'juj and Ma'juj because there's a lot of material to digest and discuss. Our Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. وَالَّذِي nafsi biyadihi." I swear by him in whose hands is my soul. You shall continue to perform Hajj and Umrah. And you will continue to cultivate and plant trees even after Ya'juj and Ma'juj. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. So in Sahih Bukhari, we learn another interesting fact. Ya'juj and Ma'juj is not the end of the Ummah. What is the purpose of this hadith? O oh, Ummah, you will not be destroyed. O oh, Muslims, you are going to be here, don't worry. No external enemy will eliminate you. This is a prediction and it has been true throughout all of history and it will continue to be true. Our Prophet made three du'as to Allah and he said, Allah gave me two of them and he denied me one. Remember this? We went over it a few weeks ago. The second one was, O oh Allah, do not allow my ummah to be destroyed by an external enemy. And Allah said, I've given it to you. Never will an external enemy decimate and eliminate the ummah, even if they eliminate parts of the ummah. The whole ummah will never be gotten rid of by an external enemy. So the Prophet ﷺ is giving good tidings. You're worried about the Quraysh, you're worried about this and that, don't worry. I am telling you, I swear by Allah, not only will you survive, you will do Hajj and Umrah. You'll retain your religion. And you will cultivate, you'll retain your dunya. Even after Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So, even Ya'juj and Ma'juj are not the end of Muslims. There shall be Umrah and Hajj, and there shall be cultivation and planting even after Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So, this is another interesting thing that we derive. In another hadith, Muttafaq Ali Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet وسلم, entered in upon some of our mothers, some of his wives, and he was agitated. He was concerned. He was worried. And he put his finger and his thumb together in a circle. He put his finger and his thumb in a circle. And he said that, La ilaha illallah, waylul lil Arab, min sharrin qadi qatarab. La ilaha illallah, waylul lil Arab, min sharrin qadi qatarab. La ilaha illallah, woe to the Arabs. And this means Muslims because at that time all the Muslims were Arabs. Woe to the Muslims, woe to the Arabs from an evil that has now come very close. What is this evil? Umm Salama asked, what is this evil? He said, today a hole of this size, hence the ishara, has been opened up from the wall of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Now this hadith is muttafaq alayh, the highest level of authenticity for us. Today, a hole of this size has been opened up from the wall of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Umm Salama said, Ya Rasulallah, anuhlaku wa fina salihun. Will we be destroyed and there's still righteous people amongst us? 
will piety not save us? And our Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, إِذَا كَثُرُ الْخَبَثِ Yes, even if there's still pious people, but if filth is prevalent everywhere, the piety of some individuals will not protect you. It might protect them on Judgment Day. It might protect them. In fact, it will protect them on Judgment Day. But societies will not be protected when corruption and evil and fitna and licentiousness and nudity and fahisha is rampant everywhere. The piety of a few folks will not prevent the adab of Allah from coming. Nasrullah salama wal afiyah. If you understand this hadith, then you should make sure you are at least pious. So this hadith tells us that Ya'juj and Ma'juj's wall has a hole this size in the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Hadith in Tirmidhi in which Abu Huraira narrates that every single day Ya'juj and Ma'juj try to dig out and every day they are met with an angel and the angel tells them enough for today go back and so they go back until finally on the final day the angel mentions the famous phrase inshallah come back and the next day when they come back so the the narration is very long it basically means every day they come back and they find all of the work that they have done goes back to nothing they have to start from the beginning again until the last day when they find they come back the work of yesterday is still there they still are carved in so now they start from where they left off and they break through so this is a hadith that mentions that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are carving every day and that every single day they get to a place until the angel turns them uh, back in another hadith in Sahih Muslim we learn that after the Dajjal is killed, Isa will congratulate his followers and give con con consolation to his followers. And within that time frame or a very short time frame, Allah will inspire Isa that a new group has come. Ibadalli. Creations of mine have come. No one can fight them. No one can fight them. So take my servants and go to Jabal Tur, go to Mount Tur and protect them over there. Then Allah will send Ya'juj and Ma'juj out and so Isa and the Muslims will not see them. They will be protected in the caves of Tur Sayna somewhere. Wherever Musa was or in that region, they will be protected over there. Now, in this hadith, we learn that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are so dangerous, so evil, that Allah Himself says, nobody can fight them. Interestingly enough, this army has just fought the Dajjal. This army has just fought the Dajjal, and they have won over the Dajjal. And they are told, you cannot fight Ya'juj and Ma'juj. In fact, it is so bad that Allah protects them even from seeing Ya'juj and Ma'juj. They just flee by the command of Allah before Ya'juj and Ma'juj come. They find protection in the caves that Allah tells them to find protection in before Ya'juj and Ma'juj come and they remain in those caves. For how long? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And in fact, in one narration, uh, it mentions that uh, Isa and his followers, they will seek refuge in a cave for so long that the, the, the what is the, the term I'm looking for? The head of a ram, the head of a goat, the head of a ram, a dead ram, will be more precious to them than 100 gold dinars. Now the head of a ram is almost useless. It has no meat. It has nothing you can benefit from. You throw it to the side. But they will be in the cave for so long that that head will be more precious to them than a hundred gold coins. A fortune. They have nothing to eat and drink until finally when they notice whatever they notice. We don't know. The hadith doesn't mention. Maybe there's quiet. Maybe there's something. They will say, who can go and volunteer and see what is going on outside the cave? 
So a man will volunteer, he will be considered the best of them, and he will resign himself to die the death of a shaheed. He's given up that he's going to die the death of a shaheed. And he will come out only to see that the world is full of corpses of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The world is full of corpses of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And then he will call out the people and they will come out and they will see not a single hand span of the earth except that it is piled with Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the world will stench. There will be a stench that they cannot bear from Ya'juj and Ma'juj's body. So they will desperately plead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this. And Allah Azza wa Jal will send a rain that will cleanse the earth, a cleansing that it has never had before. Deep cleansing from Allah Azza wa Jal. In another narration, Allah will bring a special type of bird that will pick up their bodies and take them away. So we have the removal of the corpses, then we have a special rain that will wash away the remnants as well. So this is another tradition from uh, Sunan At-Tirmidhi. We also have, we also have in Musnad Imam Ahmad the, 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 the phrase which is also in other books as well that Allah Azza wa Jal will send Ya'juj and Ma'juj and they will descend from every single plane. وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِنُ This is a Quranic verse. And they will pass by At-Tabariyya and they will drink from At-Tabariyya. It's a massive lake. We'll mention which one it is in a while. And by the time the last of them passes by, there will be no water in the lake of Tabariyya. And the last batch will say, there used to be water over here. And Isa and his followers will remain trapped in a cave until the head of a lamb is more precious than a hundred gold coins. As I mentioned this also in Tirmidhi. Then they will make dua to Allah to save them from Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So Allah will send a disease against them. Ya'juj and Ma'juj would not be killed with the sword. Allah will send a disease against them that will attack their necks and they will die the death of one person. When one of them dies, all of them die. It is a simultaneous death. The death of one person. These billions or millions or hundreds of millions of people, they will die instantaneously the death of one person. The death of one person and then this man will come out. The hadith goes on the back to the one that I mentioned. The man will come out terrified, scared. He will find everybody is already dead. Then Isa will come out. They will find not a single space to stand except the bodies will be rotting. So Isa will make dua again. So Allah will send birds with the necks of Bakhtari camels. Bakhtari camels, the Bactrian camels, the camels that have these U-shaped necks. There will be birds like this. Massive birds will come. Maybe Tayran Ababil something like this they will take them and then throw them wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills so this is another narration yet another narration yet another narration Ya'juj and Ma'juj will conquer everybody in this earth they will kill everyone pause here footnote who will they kill clearly not the followers of Isa so the remnants of the army of Dajjal anybody who fled and was not caught any human beings that have not embraced Allah and believed in Isa at this point in time these will now be destroyed by Ya'juj and Ma'juj so Ya'juj and Ma'juj will conquer the world and they will get to Tur and Tur is where Isa is they will get to Tur in one narration they will get to the Jabal of Quds the mountain of Quds is this Mount Olives? Is this the mount that is in front of um, Aqsa? In that region they will be. And they will find nobody to conquer. They've conquered everybody. So one of them will say, we have conquered the inhabitants of this world. Let us conquer the inhabitants of the heavens. So they will throw an arrow towards the heavens. And Allah will cause the arrow to come back full of blood. In another narration, they will wave their spears towards the heavens and Allah will cause their spears to come back with blood. And so they will say, we have now conquered those in the heavens. Then Isa will make the dua and then they will be uh, destroyed. Now, this lake Tabariya, most of our commentators 
mention that this is the Lake Tiberius, the Lake Tiberius. And this is also called by the Christians the famous Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, okay? And to this day, it is called Tabariya by the Palestinians and the Arabs of that region. Tabariya, it is called the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee, it is a massive, massive lake. It is a massive amount of water. It has fed the crops and the people for two, three thousand years. What group is Ya'juj and Ma'juj that in one generation that lake which has given mankind water for two, three thousand years will be gone? Think about that. How much will this group drink? How much will they? I mean, I have seen Tabari, like many of you, Tabari, many of you have been to the Sea of Galilee. If you go to that land, you see it. You can, it's like a mini ocean. That's why it's called the Sea of Galilee. It's like a mini ocean, even though it's not a sea technically, but it looks like it. It's massive. You can barely see. I mean, you can see, but you can barely see the end. This all water will be gone in one group? How? Think about this. It's very strange. How can it go? But this is what the hadith says. Also, what type of enemy is this? That the people of Isa haven't even seen them. What type of enemy that they cannot physically even fight them? I mean, are they not humans? We're going to come to this. Because they fought the Jal and his people and they were human. What is going on here? That they are not even seeing them. The man who's going to go see them is thinking he's going to die just by looking at them. He's already made up his mind, I'm a shaheed, I'm going to die. He volunteers the death of a shaheed, like oh, there's no way I'm going to be coming back. So we also have in a number of uh, traditions as well, what demonstrates their quantity, is that the Prophet ﷺ said that the Muslims will use the weapons and the armor of Ya'juj and Ma'juj for many years to come. So they will get this stuff. In one hadith, in Muslim Ibn Muhammad, he said, the beasts of the earth will grow fat and feed themselves for many years from Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So the corpses will be so much that Ya'juj and Ma'juj will fertilize the earth. And from this fertilization, there shall be a time of great opulence in terms of food. Perhaps the most opulent time in the history of mankind will take place. Where our Prophet ﷺ said, one pomegranate, one rumman will feed an entire tribe. And one leg of lamb will be enough for a large group of people. In other words, things are going to change. Small quantities, or maybe it's not small, maybe the rumman will be a massive amount. Maybe things are going to change. And again, we're going to come back to these interpretations because either all cryptic phrases and perhaps we can rethink through them if only to save the iman of our young men and women who are rethinking through these things as well. In, Musa, in Sunan ibn Majah, the Prophet ﷺ said, when you see this happen, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, when you see Ya'juj and Ma'juj happen, then expect the hour to come. Expect judgment day. Expect qiyamah. Just like the pregnant lady at the end of her labor is just waiting for the cry and she surprises the family when she goes into the pangs of labor. In other words, at that very end stage, right? Everybody's waiting, waiting, waiting. When will the water break? When will the pangs begin? And when it happens, everybody goes into panic mode. The Prophet gave this example. When you see Ya'juj and Ma'juj, this is the pregnant lady about to give birth. Nobody knows exactly when, but it's on Alert. Oh, husbands, remember that time frame of your life, huh? 24-hour alert, remember that? That is what the Prophet is talking about. That, those of you who are not married, make dua, make it easy, inshallah. <laughs> that, at that time frame, you're just waiting. When is it going to happen? You're anxious, was it? So the Prophet is giving a metaphor that every family knows this. That time frame is tense. You don't know, you're expecting. So the Prophet said, when you see Ya'juj and Ma'juj, that's the time frame. Just like that pregnant lady will be given uh, birth at that time. Now, uh, what do our classical scholars say about Ya'juj and Ma'juj? So firstly, is the term Arabic or is it non-Arabic? Our scholars, some of them said that the term is Arabic and it comes from Ajja. Ajja ya ujju ajjan. So Ajja means to kindle fire. Ajja means when the fire spurns outwards. However, in my humble opinion, it is not sound to read in Arabic meanings to proper nouns that are found in the Quran and Sunnah. 
because Arabic is a language that has come you know, in the time of our process, it reached its pinnacle. But it wasn't around 10,000 years ago. It was another language back then. If you know the study of linguistics, if you know language, languages evolve. Languages are things that are fluid. Language never stays the same. It is something that comes and goes, and all languages are interconnected in the great family of languages. And you have these, you know, um, language bundles, if you like, the Afro-Asiatic language, the Semitic and Hebrew languages, the Romance languages. You have these language bundles that are all interconnected. And interestingly enough, footnote here, they all go back to one language. There is the mother of all languages. And why are we talking about languages? Let's get back to Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So they say that Ya'juj and Ma'juj goes to Arabic. And I say, I'm not buying it. It's a classical noun. It has very little to do with, with Arabic as well. The term Ya'juj and Ma'juj is found in pre-Islamic literature, Gog and Magog. It is found, it is pre-Islamic, Gog and Magog. And it is mentioned in the Old Testament, Gog and Magog. And in the New Testament, the book of Revelations mentions the, Gog, the release of Gog and Magog, that Gog and Magog are gonna ga gather for the battle. So this is in the book of Revelations, and this predates Islam. So there's references to Gog and Magog that they're going to gather for the, for the great battle as well. So the Old Testament mentions Gog and Magog. The New Testament mentions Gog and Magog. And the Midrash mentions Gog and Magog. What is the Midrash? The Midrash is like the tafsir literature for the Jews. The Midrash is the commentary on the Torah. And it consists of legends and fables that go back many, many centuries before Islam. You have the Babylonian Midrash. You have other Midrashic texts. So the Midrash is pre-Islamic Jewish exegesis it is tafsir literature that is ancient it's not the torah it is the commentary of the torah that the ancient sages the rabbis the 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 ulama of the past they commented on and in the midrash you find some very very interesting literature which is not the time to go into but there are parallels with the quran and sunnah which you can anyway let's not go down there so where are we so uh midrash the midrash mentions gog and magog what does the Midrash say? The, Midra the Midrash says that there will be a forerunner to the Messiah. We talked about the concept of Messiah in Judaism, remember? You guys remember, right? And Moses Maimonides put belief in the Messiah as a part of his 13 points of Aqidah. Is it the 11th or the 12th point? We're going to believe in the Messiah. A day will come when the Messiah will come. It is a part of Jewish literature. What I didn't tell you in that class two weeks ago, because it's not related, but now I should have mentioned it in hindsight, they actually, or some segments of Judaism, believe in two types of Messiah, the minor Messiah and the major Messiah. Now that we're talking about Gog and Magog, I have to bring this up. So they say that there will be a forerunner to the real Messiah. And this forerunner will defeat Israel's enemies. When they say Israel, they don't mean the country. They mean Bani Israel. Remember this, right? When the Midrash says Israel, they mean mu'mins, Muslims, i.e. Jews from their perspective. You understand? They don't mean the country. So they say that this Jewish messianic precursor, the minor messiah, will defeat Israel's enemies Gog and Magog and then the real Messiah will come and then judgment will take place and then the righteous will be rewarded meaning with Jannah if that's their reward now this is interesting because this is Midrashic literature and it mentions two figures and it mentions Gog and Magog and it mentions judgment day all in the same paragraph Allahu A'lam we have the Mahdi we have the Messiah we have Gog and Magog. We have Yom Al Qiyamah all in the same paragraph as well. We find those things. Now, I did mention briefly there are two ways to interpret these things. If you're a secular, agnostic, atheist, if you're a person who believes in history and not God, then you will say, ah, look, Muslims, Jews, they are taking from one another, right? And that's the standard interpretation of modern day academics. The great flood is a myth that transcends all civilizations according to modern historians. As I had mentioned, I think earlier, the Great Flood is a myth, I'm saying as a secular historian, it is a myth that transcends all civilizations. Every civilization believes in a Great Flood. You can analyze this and say, okay, this means it's a common folklore literature. The Old Testament has it, the Quran has it, Native Indians has it, the Aborigines have it. So there is a myth of a Great Flood. 
Or you can flip it around 180 degrees and you can say the reason why all of these civilizations have the myth of the great flood is because it's not a myth, it's a fact. You can flip it around and that's what we would do. So the fact that the Midrash mentions the pre-Messiah, Gog and Magog, the Messiah, Qiyamah, and Islam mentions it, could be the source is the same. Maybe that's why there's so much parallel between the two. So Gog and Magog is mentioned, we said, in the Quran and Sunnah. It is mentioned in the Old and New Testament. It is mentioned in Midrashic literature. How have our historians understood Gog and Magog? Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Ibn Kathir mentions. Let's try to finish this up today because I don't want to go too late. Ibn Kathir mentions that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are from the children of Adam. They are Bani Adam. They are not an alien species. They are flesh and blood like us. And some of our early historians, and this is not Quran and Sunnah, this is just folklore and history, they say Ya'juj and Ma'juj goes back to Yafith ibn Nuh. Yafith ibn Nuh. Now, this motif is biblical and it is found in the Tabi'un. It's not in the Quran and Sunnah. It is biblical and we find it in our early history. And that is that Nuh had three sons. Sam and Ham and Yafith. This is a common motif that is found in the Old Testament. It is something that the Semitic races believe in and it is found not in the Quran, not in the Sunnah, but in where? Early Islamic historical traditions which is why we don't necessarily have to believe in it. If it was the words of Allah and His Messenger, سَمِعْنَا وَاطَعْنَا If it's the word of a tabi'i, or even a sahabi, because this is history and it's not ilm al-ghayb, we don't have to accept it. So this issue, we find it in the tabi'un, that Nuh had three sons, Sam, Ham, and Yafith. And from Sam, we get the Semitic peoples, the Arab and the Hebrew race, and also according to this interpretation, Faris and Rum, the Persians and the Romans, right? Hence why, again, bit of a tangent. <laughs> Problem is I love these tangents and I don't have time. Ah, see, that was a bell. Don't go into these tangents here, huh? Back in the 1910s when there was race laws in America, there were race laws in America. Hitler got his race laws from America, by the way. A tangent upon a tangent, there you go. Uh, there was a problem. How do we classify Arabs? How do we classify Arabs? How do we classify Desi Lok? A Hindu sued in the Supreme Court. And he argued, I'm not making this up. You can look this up, a famous case. I forgot the title. Singh versus, no, it wasn't Singh. I'm joking, that was just a joke. I was a scrap that. It was a, but it was a Supreme Court case. Supreme Court case. And he argued that he is, what do you think he argued? Aryan, very good, yes, very good, exactly. He argued he's Aryan. Aryan means Caucasian. In fact, he said, I am the Asli Aryan. You guys are Nakli, Nakli Mal, I'm the real guy. And he used these race theories, and from this as well, Middle Easterners said, well, we are Caucasians, we are the descendants of Sam. They brought in the Bible. We are this, so this is now a theory that they had. And that is why to this day, some people say if you're Arab or Desi, you're technically Caucasian. And in fact, all of this is a little bit antiquated to be honest. These views and whatnot, they don't, they don't add up scientifically. So all of this is anyway. But the point is, this is the notion that Sam is Semitic. And Ham is the father of the Barbar and the Qibt and the Sudan. So African people's Ham. And Yafith is the father of the Atraq and the Slavs and the Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So the Russians and the Mongolians and whatnot are Yafith. To be brutally honest, brutally honest, this entire trope smacks of racism. And it's not found in the Quran and Sunnah. And it seems to be biblical. And it seems some of our early commentators copied and pasted from the Old Testament, which is actually very common. There's a genre called Israeliyat, where some of our earliest scholars, they would study the Midrash and they would study the Jewish folklore. And at that time, the Jewish folklore was considered to be a civilization worthy of admiration and respect. So they would 
take this and then speak it in Arabic to the masses and the people would think that this is a part of Islamic folklore even though it is coming from the Midrash. And this is well known, but I'm not inventing this up. It's called the Israeliyat. Look this up. So Allah knows best. I am very skeptical of all of this in any case. So Ibn Kathir says they are the children of Yafith. That's what I'm trying to say. All of this was that. And this is the standard interpretation of the majority of our medieval scholars. The fact that Yajuj and Majuj are Bani Adam, it seems pretty clear from our tradition. Bani Adam means human beings. And we learn this from a number of evidences of them is the famous hadith in Bukhari itself where Allah says to Adam, O Adam, take the people of hell to hell and he shall take his children. And that's when the 999 will go. So the fact that his children includes Ya'juj and Ma'juj shows that they are Bani Adam. Okay, now we have some really bizarre interpretations that are found in our books. And again, we have to, again, be a bit more discerning. Just because it's written in Arabic doesn't mean it's the gospel truth, pun definitely not intended. Just because we find it in an ancient book doesn't mean anything. We find ancient books written in our tradition that mention bizarre stories, truly mind-boggling. Some of the earliest books like Ka'b al-Ahbar and others. And there is a tradition found that once Adam had a wet dream and his fluid fell on the earth and that earth sprouted forth and it became Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So we find this in our folklore and we find it in respectable medieval books. And that's why, dear Muslims, we do need to be critical of our own tradition. We do need to be. Our ancient scholars were not infallible. We respect them. Wallahi, we do. But they were people of their time and place. And we need to look at it in our time and place and be cognizant of their humanness as we are cognizant of our humanity as well. So this is also found that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are Bani Adam but not Bani Hawa. Go figure. In any case, um, getting back to Ya'juj and Ma'juj, time is so limited, I have so much to say. Let's see if we can summarize this. To be brutally honest, standard medieval interpretation of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is the following. This is what you find in Ibn Kathir. You find it in the tafsir literature of a Samarqandi and of a Tha'labi. And basically, this is the mainstream interpretation for our classical and middle ages of Islam. Ever since the beginning of writing tafsir, let's say three, four hundred hijra, up until pre-modernity, up until uh, going to CE 1800s or whatnot. If you look at any book of tafsir, any book of history, the notion was the following. Ya'juj and Ma'juj are a bizarre, exotic tribe in the nether regions of the world that have been trapped by Dhul Qarnayn thousands of years ago and they're still trapped to this day. And quite a few medieval historians have reported that I know of a friend of mine who traveled to the end of the world and he saw with his own eyes the wall of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We find this in respectable Islamic books. The notion that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are a living tribe blocked to this day behind the wall that was built 4,000, 5,000 years ago. That wall miraculously is still there. People can see on the one side and on the other side you have these savages that Allah knows how they're eating, drinking, replicating, whatnot, and they're still there for eons and eons and eons. This is the standard interpretation of our scholars of the tradition, not of the Quran and Sunnah. You understand what I'm going to get at, okay? We don't blame them. In their time frame, the world was unexplored. In their time frame, nobody traveled the world. The reason why Marco Polo became famous and Ibn Battuta became famous was because they traveled half the world. That's it. And they became world famous because they did what nobody had done. They simply went from one side of the known civilized world to the other side and they came back. Marco Polo to Naples, to Italy or to Sicily, wherever he was, Naples or Italy, where was he? And Ibn Battuta to, uh, to uh, Tunisia, where he was from. So people didn't travel. 
and folklores and legends were very common and it was easy to believe these types of things that there is this nether region of and, and you know if you read by the way even Ibn Battuta by the way yani you find bizarre fables you find belief in mermaids and you find weird creatures and whatnot. This is what he believed. He really believed that there are races and aliens, or not aliens, but you get my point. This is the, the, the notion of his time. Marco Polo as well, he believes these types of things. So it's not surprising that our medieval scholars believe this type of stuff. Now, obviously, dare I say, anybody who knows science and geography and modern civilization, you cannot believe that there is a tribe for 4,000 years trapped behind a wall. I mean, if you believe this, any, that's your position, I, I cannot believe it. I'm just being, I cannot, I, I find this very difficult to believe. So this has led people to do multiple things. We have 20 minutes left after, wrap it all up now, subhanAllah. The first interpretation, which is the standard interpretation of medieval Islam, is that, okay, maybe there are places in the world that are undiscovered, Maybe there is a race of people locked up behind the Caucasus Mountains or in Mongolia or whatever, and they're still over there. And Greenland? Huh? <laughs> Greenland, interesting. How would Dhul Qarnain get to Greenland? Because he's traveling. He didn't go on a ship, he walked on a road. So that kind of, it's not the Bermuda Triangle, no. Um, but many Muslims still believe this I have nothing to say to this if you believe it I have nothing to say I don't believe it is all I'm trying to say I'm not trying to dismiss any person's belief and this is the belief of medieval scholars if you still believe that there is a big wall that is lasting for thousands of years and by the way no human structure is that fortified for four or five thousand years that Nothing happens to it. Even the Great Wall of China needs to be built up or whatnot. I mean, it doesn't work that way. But anyway, if you believe, and anyway, so this is, uh, what can I say? If you believe it, you believe it. I am somebody who, I, 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 what, can, what can I say? I don't, I just, my mind doesn't believe this. Others have said, we need to reinterpret Ya'juj and Ma'juj metaphorically. And... This goes back to another thing that I kept on stalling when we talked about the Dajjal because I wanted to talk about it with Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And that is this newfangled interpretation. And it is newfangled. You do not find it in pre-modernity. This is a very modern interpretation. It only begins in the 60s and whatnot. And it has now become common, uh, very common. So much so that many famous people, many mainstream people are explicitly or implicitly say, saying it in this land and in some islands in the Bermudas as well. There is a famous person who is well known for this type of theory. No names mentioned. That's not my philosophy to mention names typically. Where they say Dajjal and Ya'juj and Ma'juj are symbolic. Symbolic. It's not an entity. Dajjal is, he will say, globalization. And Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they might say, Russia and America, the superpowers. And honestly, I mean, okay, jokes aside, I admire the fact they're trying to salvage the tradition because they understand that mainstream interpretation doesn't make sense. So they're trying to salvage the tradition. And they say, you know what? The Jal is a demonic force. The Jal is a global empire. The Jal is the new world order. Then you get into the triangle and the eye and this and that. And the whole rabbit's hole begins. You can now, once you go down the rabbit's hole, make dua, there's nothing to be done. Once a person goes down that hole. What can I say? If a person believes this as well, the problem comes the same traditions that you get the concept of Dajjal from, those same traditions tell you a lot about the Dajjal. So you can't pick and choose and reinterpret everything. Either you reject Dajjal in totality, which some progressives and modernists have done. Dajjal is not mentioned in the Quran. They reject all hadith. So they say, khalas, let's be done with. And they reject Ya'juj and Ma'juj hadith. So they say, well, the Quran just mentions two tribes, so they're going to come, some races will come and have a big war. Fair enough, if your principle is you're going to reject hadith, that's not ours. If your principle is no hadith, then you can derive an entire interpretation that is independent of mainstream Sunni Islam and 
be gone with it. But the deal of these folks is they claim to be Sunnis. And they are popular in Sunni circles. And they are trying to metaphorically reinterpret these traditions. And we say that I don't think in this case you can have your cake and eat it as well. It's nice too. I love to have my cake and eat it as well. But in this particular case, I don't think it is methodologically sound. Because the same traditions that tell you about the Dajjal, tell you about Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they have all of these details we mentioned. And it's pretty vivid, the impression given, right? The Dajjal will be killed by Isa, one on one. The blood of the spear will be shown. It's clear. Ya'juj and Ma'juj, the corpses will be piled up. I mean, those same traditions mention what we have just mentioned. So I'm not too sympathetic to this reinterpretation as well. Is that clear? I personally don't buy it. A third interpretation, and this became common. The first person I know who said this was back in the 50s. Maybe we formed it at first, I know, back in the 50s. He said that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are the Chinese race. And the great wall that was built by the Qarnayn is the wall of China. And this notion spread as well back in that era. Because he as well, the scholar, again, I grant him credit that he realized the traditional interpretation doesn't make sense. So he said, we need to rethink through this. So he attempted to rethink through, and frankly, for his time and place, it was a bold move because he was criticized by mainstream Sunnism. Mainstream Sunni scholars said, no, no, we believe in this and that. But he wanted to, again, salvage the tradition. Of course, what is the problem with believing that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are the Chinese folks and the Great Wall in the Quran is the Great Wall of China. What is the problem with uh, this uh, interpretation? Who can tell me? Hmm? <laughs> I like this. Chinese Muslims, no, that's not the biggest problems. We have other bigger problems than this. Hmm? That's not a problem in this case. I mean, where does one begin with the problems of this interpretation? Where does one begin? There are so many problems with this interpretation. I mean, of the, the problems of this interpretation is that we know exactly who built the Great Wall. And he wasn't a believer in Allah. Jin Shu Shuao. He wasn't a believer in Allah, the famous emperor. He was one of the pagans of the, you know, Shinto, whatever religion it was. And the Great Wall was actually built to protect the Chinese people from within, not from without. And the Great Wall is not a barrier that is impenetrable. People go in and out all the time. In fact, gasp, shock, I myself have gone in and out of the Great Wall. I, in fact, did a video that went viral two years ago. I took a group to China three years ago. And I stood on the Great Wall, and I have a video, YouTube clip. Is the Great Wall of China the Wall of Ya'juj and Ma'juj? You can look at it yourself. And I said, no, it's not. Don't worry. It's not the Great Wall of there. So, this as well, it doesn't make sense, you know, neither heads nor tails, huh? Nasar naper, literally, neither heads nor tails, doesn't make any sense. The wall of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is not the wall of China in any stretch of the imagination. It doesn't make sense as well. Where does this leave us? Another group of, let's finish this one, I know I promised Q&A, let me finish this up. Another group says, and this is something that I have heard myself, some ulama say, that Perhaps Ya'juj and Ma'juj are not on earth, but under earth. That's why the satellites haven't discovered them. And this, again, I appreciate the salvaging, I really do. But how can human beings survive? No vegetation, no plants with the sun, no oxygen, food, drink, thousands of years and according to these traditions we're talking about gazillions of people what is the answer to this conundrum of Ya'juj and Ma'juj I will disappoint you by saying there is no clear cut answer but wallahi to struggle with the truth and to admit the struggle is a safer position than to invent something that is far-fetched and then pretend that it is answering the problems. I don't have a solution to Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I am personally skeptical, maybe because of my own upbringing and my own, I mean, I have a degree in engineering. I understand mathematics and chemistry and geology and 
I, I, I just find it. Now, can you can call back Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. And I say, indeed, Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. But are we obliged to believe that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are billions of people under the earth? This is my point. If the text told us explicitly, sami'na wa ata'na. But when the texts don't tell us this, can we rethink through and say this? So I conclude with two opinions. The first of which is plausible, the second of which is even embarrassing to mention, but I will mention it. As for the plausible one, Allah knows best. Perhaps, perhaps, this notion of a living tribe of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is not correct. Because if you look at all of the traditions, there is only one tradition that is in Tirmidhi with one isnad that mentions the Ya'juj and Ma'juj are daily digging. And every single day they're told to go back. All the other traditions don't mention a living Ya'juj and Ma'juj. As for the hadith in Bukhari that the wall has been opened, that could be a wall. It could be, in this case, see, to what level of metaphor is allowed? Ijtihadi. If it were to be said, a wall has been opened is a metaphor that indeed Ya'juj and Ma'juj is now closer to you. Personally, I don't see this as that much of a stretch than to interpret all the hadith to mean Ya'juj and Ma'juj are symbolic in nature. But again, it's Ijtihadi. The only tradition that mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj are alive right now and they are digging through every single day is a solitary narration in Tirmidhi and also in other books but the same is not and I did my research for this because this is problematic and I have to say I was relieved to find classical scholars some of them did problematize this hadith Ibn Kathir amongst them who said that this tradition this tradition seems to be uh, it's an illa or a hidden defect that it is not from the Prophet Sallallahu it might be coming from the Israeliyat because Abu Huraira also stood, studied with Ka'b al-Ahbar Ka'b al-Ahbar was the son of a rabbi and he would narrate Israeliyat and Abu Huraira would listen to him and narrate and one of the students of Abu Huraira assumed it to be from the Prophet Sallallahu this is Ibn Kathir saying this, not me so he said perhaps this is from the Israeliyat and this is what I firmly believe simply because it is highly problematic to posit that there are billions of people somewhere in today's world clawing away. So the first interpretation, which is posited by a group of people, let's just leave it like that. A very wise person once said, let's just leave it like that. The first interpretation is that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are a group of people that will come towards the end of times. And they will wreak havoc and do this and that. So we get ourselves out of the problem of them being alive right now. And as for the wall of Dhul Qarnay, there was maybe their biological ancestors, maybe some other tribe that had those characteristics and they were trapped by Dhul Qarnay. That did happen. But it, we don't have to affirm that they are still trapped 5,000 years later. Rather, maybe their descendants maybe people similar to them, so they are called Ya'juj and Ma'juj, are them. This is the first interpretation. And I am very sympathetic to it, and it seems, and it solves many of our problems. There is another interpretation which I hesitate to even verbalize. And I will tell you honestly, this is not mine. I will honestly tell you, this is something that I am involved in many discussions of this nature with many people and whatnot. And one of my scholarly friends in a private conversation, so he will not allow me to mention his name. But I am telling you something that don't believe it's coming from me. Okay? You guys ready? Ready? Okay. Don't ascribe this to me, please. Who is it not from? Good. No, from my friend it is from him. Not from <laughs> don't do a double negative on me. So we were talking with a group of ulama, a group of students of knowledge, what not call them, whatever you will, and we're talking about this problematizing. It is a problem. Well, it's a problem for any rational mind. What are you going to do with Ya'juj and Ma'juj? It's not an easy thing to come around. And even he was hesitant, but he brought it up. He said, let's look at these traditions again. We see that first and foremost, 
Ya'juj and Ma'juj seem to be human but not human. You see where this is heading. And they seem to be a race of people that cannot be fought. And they seem to be doing things that are bizarre, drinking up all of this water. That's not humans can't do that. Mentally, they don't seem to be 100% there when they think they can kill the people of the heavens. This isn't normal. This isn't rational. The regular human beings alive, the followers of Isa, are so terrified of this group that they don't even want to see them. They're fleeing away from them. They will not fight them. The hadith mentions they will not be able to be fought. لا يدان أحد مقتالهم. And he mentions, if you look at the popular imagination of our times, you find a genre of literature and horror movies. You see where this is heading. And he mentions the word. And I, my jaw just dropped and I laughed. I said, are you serious? He goes, hear me out, hear me out. Don't call them that word. For those who don't know the word, maybe the youngers can tell them later on. Don't call them that word. But the concept, what if we're talking about chemical warfare, we're talking about the jad, we're talking about the bird falling down, things are happening, weapons being unleashed, weapons beyond our understanding. What if the concept is there that these groups of people are human but not quite human? And they're doing all of these things and everything just started clicking in my head. Check, 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 check. I'm like, this is so ridiculous. You will never find me saying this in a lecture. And here I am in a lecture saying it. But in any case, Allahu A'lam, frankly, it makes more sense than believing that a billion people are somewhere in Timbuktu or Zimbabwe or, or some faraway land. It makes more sense to me. Because Allahu A'lam at the end of time, also, ayas, ayas, the key point. They shall die the death of one man. How will they get gotten rid of? Allah will send a disease, some type of antivirus, some type of vaccine. <laughs> I'm just saying what my friend said. Because the hadith mentions this explicitly, does it not? Allah will send something that will get them in the neck and they will die the death of one person. So when my friend kept on going over all of these points, my laughter turned to a serious contemplation. <laughs> and I said, but how do we tell the public this? Then I said, I'll just project it onto my friend, which it is true, it is coming from him. And I'll take myself out the picture so that as you laugh, you laugh at my friend, but the laughter will slowly turn to contemplation. And deep down inside, you'll realize this makes a lot more sense than anything else out there. So we conclude by stating that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are a reality. We believe in them because the Quran believes it, mentions it. And that these enigmatic descriptions should not cause us doubt because strange things will happen towards the end of times. Don't base the validity of Islam on trying to understand Ya'juj and Ma'juj. That's ridiculous. We base the validity of Islam on the Quran, on the beauty of Islam, on Tawheed, on La ilaha illallah, on the fact that it answers all the big questions of life. Islam comes with some things that may be beyond our comprehension, such as Ajuj and Ma'juj. We just have to sami'na wa ata'na. And when it happens, all of these hadith will fit into place and we will see, oh, I get it. That's what was being referenced here. So in the end, Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. I promised you guys Q&A. Let's open the floor for some very specific questions. Yes, Bismillah. I agree with you that it doesn't make sense that the Great Wall is the Dhul Qarnay. 100% agreed. Yeah. West and the east. And then he went the third direction also. Thumma atba'a sababa. The third direction maybe there's more than north pole, which 
<laughs> Maybe the North Pole. So where is Ya'juj and Ma'juj? Under the ice of the North Pole, but then the cap is melting. So as they melt, maybe this is how Ya'juj and Ma'juj are going to come out. Global warming is the problem. See? It all comes back to this. Sisters, very quickly, hurry up. Yes, Bismillah. Very good, excellent point. The Quran mentions the wall, and the Prophet mentioned this thing. And I actually brought this up in our discussions with our group, closed group that we have of senior ulama. Well, these, are, these are the discussions we have, by the way, right? This is what we're talking about, <laughs> these types of bizarre things. We brought this up in this. And this brother's response, everything projected onto him, I'm scot free. This brother's response, and he did respond in this manner, was that. Perhaps there is some type of strain of virus or whatever you want to call it that it has been trapped up, it has been put away, but it will be released or unleashed at that point in time. And so this is the breaking of that wall that it will affect a lot of people. Allahu A'lam. Leave it at that. Back to the brothers, yes. What's the significance of the chosen, the prophet chosen the word external enemy? What's the significance of external enemy? Because the third request was, Oh Allah, let not my ummah fight amongst itself. And Allah said, I'm not going to give you that. So the second was external, the third was internal. And that wasn't given. Final question of the sisters. Sisters, going once, going twice. Yes, Bismillah, go ahead. And final question. Why can't our scholars say these are ayat of mutashabihat? Um, so the ayat of mutashabihat, they have a meaning that is understood and they have a meaning that is not understood. We're dealing with the part that is understood. What do we do? Now, if you want to stop at this and say, I don't want to go beyond this, that's good for you. But what do you do to our 25-year-old college kid who comes and he keeps on saying, what do we do about this? Do we believe in these fairy tales? This is mythology. Would you believe this? What do we do to that young mind? If we tell him, you shut up and don't ask questions, we turn him away. What I'm trying to do is to save the iman of that generation. Alhamdulillah, most of us elders, we have no worries. Alhamdulillah, we're not worried about these things. Whether we understand or don't understand, we know Islam is true. We know Islam to be true. Our younger generation doesn't have that level of iman in the first place. So when these issues come, their iman is not strong enough to overcome. So they say, we're going to reject Islam. So I would rather present an alternative that is somewhat palatable, and they can then accept it rather than they reject Islam. Is that clear? Inshallah, with this we conclude, and we'll continue next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.